Philippians 2, chapters 1 through 13. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now, much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fill fulfill his good purpose. Well, good morning, everyone. Let's, uh, let's consider the scripture passage that, uh, that we just heard from Philippians. It's, uh, it's known by many as uh, the, the kenosis uh, of Christ. And uh, I think we're going to find from looking at it today that, uh, that we Christians also run best when we've emptied ourselves. It's a great uh, example of uh, how something runs uh, better when it's empty. It, uh, it's the Apache attack helicopter of the Army. The Apache was too heavy when it was first released. It, it, it couldn't fly, and it cost millions of dollars, and yet the U.S. Army spent $5 billion to buy almost 760 of them. Yeah, almost a quarter of a century ago, the Army was having major trouble with its newest high-tech weapon, the Apache Longbow Attack Helicopter. Uh, a little while back, I remember reading a GAO white paper that detailed its early problems. You can find anything on the internet. Um, now, I want you to know that Boeing, uh, the manufacturer, has fixed the problems long ago, and that is, uh, as of April of this year, of 2020, they had built and sold their 2,400th uh, Apache helicopter. Speaking of which, this helicopter is very impressive. It's, uh, it's a tank killer. It, uh, it skims over the treetops at 150 miles per hour with lights out at night and fires Hellfire missiles and 70 millimeter rockets at targets up to three miles away. Unfortunately, among other things, the longbow in its initial version lacked the ability to successfully operate in combat. <clears throat> the reason? Its vertical rate of climb, also known as its VROC. Now, the Army wanted it to have a vertical rate of climb of 450 feet per minute, and it could do twice that. It could climb 900 feet per minute, but there was a catch, and this was a big catch. It could only do that when it was entirely empty. When the longbow was fully loaded for battle with crew, ammo, and fuel, its VROC was a negative 550 feet per minute. That means it lost 550 feet of altitude every minute, even at full power. Yikes! Now, in today's text, the Apostle Paul is, I think, suggesting something about Christians. That's very similar to the early version of the Apache Longvall helicopter. And that is this. Christians operate best, not when we're full of ourselves, but when we are empty. Paul suggests that we need a fresh understanding of our own spiritual vertical rate of climb, a vertical rate of climb into the presence of God. And we make this climb by following the example of Jesus, the one who God has exalted and given the name that is above every name. But let's remember the wonderfully odd and unexpected thing about the rise of Jesus into the highest heaven. It came as a result of his willingness to humble himself, to empty himself, and to become obedient to God's will, even to the point of death. 
Now, the Greek word for empty is the verb kinao, and it can either mean to empty a container by physically taking things out until there's nothing left, or it can mean to pour out as a container of something, like a pitcher of water until there's nothing left in it. Either way, the point is that Jesus emptied himself of all his heavenly status and rights and power and glory so that he could obediently and humbly pursue the will of God through the way that he lived his life. Because he did, he saved the world. Friends, imagine what you or I could each do in our own little piece of the world if we would be willing to empty ourselves of our status and our privileges and the rights that we think we have over our lives and the things in our lives. Wow. You know, we might say that our Christian spiritual vertical rate of climb is in direct proportion to our spiritual vertical rate of descent. That is, according to the description of Christ in Philippians, the way to heaven is really pretty down to earth through the, living the daily practice of heartfelt humility and service to others in the name of God. The more we humble ourselves, the more we climb into the presence of God. The more we look after the affairs of others, the more our own affairs will be taken care of. I guess you could say the more we follow Christ, the more we look like the early version of the Longbow Helicopters. Disciples who work best operate most successfully when we empty ourselves. You see, what doesn't work for an attack helicopter works perfectly for a loving Christian. We do operate best when we are empty. Empty of selfishness, empty of pride, empty of greed, empty of self-righteousness and control. And here's the details that Paul lays out in his letter on how we empty ourselves. He says, first, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. What? No more power plays at work or school, if you go back. Uh, no more angling for an advancement. No more getting what you want, being the winner. No buttering up your boss or your friends or your parents or your teacher or your coach. No more gossiping about so-and-so to make yourself look better and them look worse. Wow, you know, for some people, there goes half their day. But in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. This means that we can't just go with the obvious to us. You know, of course, we regard those recent saints of the church like Mother Teresa better than ourselves or the late, great Billy Graham as better than ourselves. But Paul's saying that we are to regard the great multitude of generic others in our world as better than ourselves, okay? All lives matter. Black lives, brown lives, white lives, and every other color of life. The person who's not keeping six foot social distance with you in line at high V, or the person who makes a snide comment about your mask wearing protocol or lack thereof. Paul says, have regard even for them. And Paul's not letting us off the spiritual hook here by just passively complying mentally with our own kenosis or our self-emptying. We can't, we can't just not look down our noses at others. We have to actually reach out our hand in friendship to them. Let each of you look not to your own interests, Paul advises, but to the interests of others. Look after the affairs of other people first, and you're going to discover that oftentimes your own needs are met as well. You see, and those of you who have done this in your lives, you know this is true. You've experienced it. When we do unto others with grace, generosity, even and maybe especially with some self-sacrifice on our part, we find that our own lives are enriched and enhanced. And we've talked about this so many times before, that sociological research on what's known as helper's high, that state of mind that ranges from you know, contentment, satisfaction, and happiness to mild euphoria, and that occurs after a person has chosen to serve others in some beneficial way. On the screen here, you're seeing some, uh, some pictures of uh, a young missionary to Vietnam who you help support. A young missionary who was graduating college but who chose to defer her career as a teacher and humbled herself to serve God's kingdom and great commission. You know, 
her spiritual vertical rate of descent, a missionary to Viet Vietnam, and look at the pictures. I just received an ecstatic email from her. That's her spiritual vertical rate of climb with these pictures. She's now baptizing new Christians in Vietnam. Maybe the greatest benefit of such concern for the interests of others is that it builds community between Americans and Vietnamese, between Christians and non-Christians, between adults and children, between the healthy and the sick, the rich and the poor, the Republicans and Democrats, uh, the black life and the white life, the first world and the third world, right? Paul wants us to be in community with one another. That's why he wrote of the same mind, having the same love, being one in soul and one in mind in verse 2. In short, he wants us to be friends, people who look after the affairs of others first, who keep in mind what's best for their friends, that is, the other members of the body of Christ. You know, there's another beautiful modern-day illustration of kenosis or self-emptying of our selfish rights and pride and the benefits to both ourselves and others than that it produces. Let's end our message with, uh, with that this morning. The folklore surrounding Poland's famous concert pianist and prime minister, Ignacy Paderewski, includes this story. There was a, a mother who uh, wanted to encourage her young son's progress at the piano, so she bought tickets for a Paderewski concert performance. And when the night arrived, they, you know, they found their seats near the front of the concert hall, and they, they boy, they just took in this, this majestic Steinway grand piano waiting on the stage. Well, you know how it is. You know, you get there half an hour or so early, and you kind of start in conversation. She was turning and talking to the woman next to her, and she didn't notice that, uh, that her son kind of slipped out uh, up the aisle. Well, when 8 o'clock arrived, so you, uh, you know how it is. The house lights come down, the spotlights go up, and uh, the audience got quiet, and only then did they notice this little boy up on the bench on the Steinway innocently picking out Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Well, his mother gasped, but before she could get up to retrieve her son, Paderewski walked out on stage, and he quickly moved over to the keyboard. He says, don't quit, keep playing, he whispered to the little boy. And then leaning over, Paderewski reached around with his arms, uh, and his left hand began filling in a bass part, and soon his right arm, you know, was reaching around the other side and circling the child to add a running obligato. And together, this, the old master and the young novice held the crowd mesmerized. Friends, in our lives, when we empty ourselves of prideful and arrogant thoughts about what is our due, how the spotlight should be on us, not on somebody else, and instead, we choose to reach out to help another. Maybe someone who's weaker or younger or older or poorer or not as popular or not as smart or as not as good looking, unpolished as though we may be. That is when you begin to hear in your life the voice of your master who surrounds you and whispers in your ear time and time again, don't quit, keep playing. And as you do, you find that God augments and supplements you until a work of amazing beauty is created through you and in you. We may swoop down to earth when we share our wealth and our possessions and our time and our energy. But in that descent of humbleness, we find ourselves gaining momentum for a breathtaking climb to the heavens. We'll discover that all of our resources are meant to be shared, and it's in that sharing that our time and talent and our treasure gain their true value. So, can we improve our spiritual vertical rate of descent? Anything we do to humble ourselves and help others is an act of obedience to the Lord, who emptied himself. So, as Paul counsels, let the same mind be in you, and in me, that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited or gained, but humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. 
It's only after his humble vertical rate of descent that Christ begins his glorious vertical rate of climb. His vertical rate of climb into the highest heaven. So friends, this week, guided by the Holy Spirit, let's each think and pray about ways that we can dump the extra baggage of pride and self-centeredness that's weighing us down. And then think and pray about ways that we can be obedient to God's will by lifting another person or persons up. Remember, as followers of Jesus Christ, we too fly best when we're empty. Amen. I want to thank you again for worshiping with us wherever you are today. As you go out into this, uh, this new day and, and this new week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace now and forever. Amen.